Um, I think it was, I mean, it was kind of cold. Like there was really not much going on. It's not like a regular OB visit. Um, I don't remember anyone else in the waiting room with us. So it was kind of, I don't know. It was, I didn't know what I was walking into. It just didn't feel like a regular OB visit. So that's when I was starting to feel a little bit more nervous. And same for me, obviously during COVID, we had to wear masks, which was, you know, not very pleasant walking into a doctor's office where everyone's wearing masks and you can't see smiles or faces and going from a big OBGYN office with lots of families, couples going in for their appointments and it just being Itzel and I in a very small secluded office was kind of like, okay, well maybe this is more serious than I had anticipated prior. And so I was just trying to stay calm, but at the same time thinking in my head, what could it be? Like, why are they referring us here? And so I think the whole appointment, which ended up being an hour, hour and 15 minutes was very, very long and drawn out for that same reason. So after about 45 minutes of having an ultrasound, the doctor comes in and basically says nothing about the cerebellum, funny enough. He mentioned nothing about the brain. He said, <coughs> we found rocker bottom, or is, what is it? Is it rocker bottom feet? There's something wrong with the heart. There's a hole in the heart, a clenched fist. And yes, the cerebellum is small, but it's not that much of our concern. And so in that moment, I was like, oh, okay, well, that should, shouldn't be anything, right? So those were the findings that the doctor came back with. Honestly, it was so quick. I mean, like you mentioned, a 40, 45 minute ultrasound to the doctor leaving for 10, 15 minutes and not really knowing what they were doing since they weren't giving us any information. And him coming in and sharing his findings was, super, super overwhelming because he gave us so much information for the next 30 minutes. And then next thing you know, he said, here are your options, take your time, I'll give you guys the room. And I think that was the hardest because obviously the fact of not knowing and it being so new to us, this information, but at the same time, not knowing how to comfort my wife. I mean, me not holding the baby myself was hard for me because I couldn't imagine what she was going through at the same time. So I was tr trying to build up strength to be there for her, but I just got close to her on the table and held her and we cried together. And I remember specifically her saying sorry to me over and over again, as if it were her fault. When in reality, it was no one's fault because it wasn't hereditary. This isn't passed down from, you know, spouse to kid or, you know, parents, grandparents to grandkids. It's just a fluke as far as pregnancy. And so that was super hard for me seeing how bad she was hurting and I couldn't do anything because we had no information as far as what trisomy 13 was. So honestly, I think when he mentioned like the concerns he had with like the hands, the feet in my head, I was like, okay, well, that's really no issue, right? Like we can figure something out for the heart. Like it should be fine. Um, it wasn't until he really dove into the groupings of these findings and what they meant. Um, that is what really scared me because he said it was the fact that it was all these things clumped together that made it so that he strongly believed that it was a genetic disorder. Um, and so he went on and said, I, are you familiar with trisomy 21, which is, down syndrome. And I said, yes. And he said, okay, well, it's kind of like this, but there's trisomy 18 and trisomy 13. And he said, well, these are higher risks. And so the chances of your baby surviving are not very high. Um, so he kind of talked a little bit about those. Honestly, a lot of it is a blur, but it ended up feeling like I didn't have anything to worry about with the first couple findings. And then I, uh, my whole world came crashing down towards the end when he grouped all of these findings together. So I remember towards the end of this, like it was probably like a 30 minute rant of the doctor, just maybe not a rant, but an explanation of the doctor. He said, we don't know for sure. This is my, what I am feeling. And so he said, we have three ways to kind of get ourselves out of doubt. We have 
blood tests that you could do. He's like, but it's not always 99%. It'll just give you percentages of the risks. So he's like, it's not really a, you know, sure thing. And then he said, there's also, okay. um, he gave, it was like two different types of tests that we could have done that weren't a hundred percent accurate. They could still have some flunks. Um, and so what he said was, what I would recommend is an amniocentesis. And he basically went through and explained a little bit of what that was and said, do you guys know what you want to do? And I was like, no, I like, we hadn't even had time to process this information yet. And he said, well, I just want you to know that, you know, you're 22 weeks, you have about till 24 weeks to decide if, if, you know, if you want to continue with this pregnancy, what you want to do. Um, and so we were kind of just shocked, um, in this moment. So those were the options that were given to us at this point. And then the doctor left and Brenton kind of described a little bit about how the rest of that appointment felt for us. And I think the hardest part for me was the fact that so much information was given to us in a very cold manner. And then he just left and said, okay, make a decision. I'll come back in 10, 15 minutes and let me know where you wanna go from here. And like you so mentioned, obviously we had to process that information like understand it emotionally and then at the same time make a decision in that moment when we didn't know if you know doing blood tests was the best option we didn't know if <clears throat> you know doing the amniocentesis uh, was the best option and just the fact that he said you know in the state of utah you're able to abort up to 26 weeks which was not 24 weeks which was not an option for us we were just kind of appalled that he would obviously he is a medical practitioner and that's his job to give us all the information but be so cold in the fact that if this were his own kid, then how would he give them that information or be a little bit more understanding of our situation. So I think that was the hardest part for me is having to make a decision right then and there. And I think we took the weekend and you know thought about it together. Itzel obviously being the mom holding the baby and not myself. And I obviously wanted to make sure that she was comfortable with whatever we were going to do. And I think after that weekend, we had a little bit more time to process and that made it a little bit easier to come back and, you know, figure out next steps.